Welcome to Mama. Hello everybody, Kieran A.K. The Laird here and I'm back with a new hardware review for you. And uh, just recently on the channel I had uh, somebody commenting um, saying that um, I hadn't done much Spectrum related stuff recently and they'd like to see me do some more Spectrum stuff. And um, I thought about it and thought no I haven't actually done anything Sinclair or Spectrum related for a while although I had a few videos that I'd planned to do but kind of forgotten about. And um, that reminded me that this was one of them, which was to actually look at the original Spectrum um, computer, the original old rubber key, um, because I hadn't looked at it on the channel yet. I've looked at just about every other model. should have really started off with this one because I've had one for absolute years. But I've looked at the Plus 2 and the Plus 3 and the, and, um, the uh, Vega, um, Vega Plus, the, the modern, modern remake ones. Um, I looked at the Spectrum Plus. Yeah, so... I've not covered the toast rack because I haven't got one. Um, and I haven't done a plus 2A actually, so I don't have a plus 2A in my collection. But I've covered most of the major models, really, um, apart from the original one, which is a bit silly, really. I should have covered this one ages ago. Although in the um, other Spectrum videos that I've done, which I will link down below in the description, like the plus 3 video and stuff, I did show my, my rubber key Spectrum because I compared the size of it to the um to the other spectrums so i'm not going to do that in this video because i don't want to cover the same ground so to speak and, and do the same stuff all over again but i'll link those other reviews down in the comments because i think they'll be interesting for you but as you can see um this is my my rubber key spectrum and it's in bloody good condition um a little scratch on the box on the front here but apart from that the box is in excellent condition as you can see um all the side flaps um, where it says that this is a 48k equipped spectrum um, the back everything all in really really good condition um, interesting that the back kind of just shows you how to hook it up and obviously tells you that you need your own TV you need your own cassette recorder um, it comes with the mains adapter comes with the manual comes with a demonstration cassette because it's a big thing about the spectrum um, that people need to understand especially the Americans don't seem to understand this this was a budget computer. It was aimed at people with not much money. In fact, originally, Sir Clive Sinclair's vision for the Spectrum was that it would cost under 100 quid to be a home computer, a powerful, colourful home computer for under 100 pounds. Didn't quite work out like that because by the time it came out in 1982, I think the base model, the, the um, uh, 16K, ended up being 129.99. Um, but actually before it wasn't long before that actually did end up coming down to to under 100 quid but to be honest hardly anyone bought the 16k models a lot of people thought that the 16k one would actually be the big seller and everyone would go for the 16ks and i actually have got interviews um from the time with various people who ran software companies who said that they were trying to aim as much software as they could um at being compatible with the 16k spectrum because they figured that most people would buy that one and as it turned out, most people didn't. They bought 48Ks. And even then, a lot of the people who bought the 16Ks then upgraded them either by a RAM pack or sending them to Sinclair to have them upgraded. They would do that for you as a service, um, put the extra RAM in. So most people bought the 48K because it wasn't a lot more for the 48K. I think I might be wrong here, but I know when it was 129.99, I've got a feeling that the the 48k might have been 169.99. It was something like that. Um, I'll try and find an advert actually. Um, I'll put it on the screen so you can see because I think it's interesting to see those old adverts from the time contemporary, so you can see um, how it was advertised and, and that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean it was it was supposed to be a budget home computer, so they tried to make this as cheap as they could. Uh, and that's what a lot of Americans don't understand because Ameri computers in America were more a premium thing um, at this stage. I mean, early on, I think there was some bu budget machines that did well, like notable example being the ZX81. The VIC-20 was, I suppose, a budget machine because it was cheap for, for what it was. So it was still quite expensive because it had a proper keyboard and stuff. But certainly the ZX81, which is a Timex Sinclair 1000 in America, did quite well initially as a cheap computer i think they did the whole thing there if it being under a hundred dollars but then later on people saw computers as a premium thing 
and tended to buy more expensive ones. Um, and then once the price war started with like the Commodore 64 um, leading the way, especially, but also its battle with the, the Texas Instruments TI-99, um, there wasn't really a place for budget computers anymore because the, the cost of home computers in general was coming down. But the UK at this time in the early 80s was very cash strapped. We had come out the back of a recession. Um, things hadn't quite got good yet. And um, yeah, and people thought it was great that they could go out and buy a, you know, a computer for around a hundred pounds, uh, and you know, five million people bought them. So, 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 so classic player was certainly onto something. And although people, a lot of people, perhaps who don't know the the ins and outs, don't think of the Spectrum as being innovative, it was because of its design, because it was you know all custom chips to make as small a computer as possible um i say all custom chips also used the z80 cpu um but most of the other chips were custom like the ula for example um which was a the most important chip in the spectrum really because it did so many different things um was all custom to make this computer as small as possible because he want so Clive's vision was that it would have a very small amount of chips on the board um to make it small and make it cheap and that's another reason why it has the so-called dead flesh keyboard or rubber keyboard Yeah, so I've opened the box there. As you can see, I've got all the polystyrene with the nice embossed Sinclair logo. I'll move that out of the way a minute, actually, because I've got some games that I've stuck behind, some random games, um, as you can see. Uh, like, you know, you've got to have, when it comes to the Spectrum, you've got to mention budget games like these from Codemasters or that one over there from Alternative, because they were such a big part of the Spectrum experience. Being able to go in a news agent and buy a game for pound ninety nine. Um, you know, you bought a cheap computer and you could buy cheap games. But inside here, I have everything, as you can see. The, um, the Spectrum itself, which is in good condition, which we'll look at the moment, apart from a bit of paint that's rubbed off there. Um, but we've got a user manual, which includes um, Introduction to Basic. And I mentioned something about the Basic in a, in a little while. Um, I just want to go through what's in the box. So that's quite cool. Then uh, introduction, a uh, nice little glossy booklet, which is, I think is how to set it up and stuff like that. Yeah, so obviously tells you how to set it up to your TV and how to use the basic commands and stuff that you need to know. Um, even a diagram of what it looks like inside. Look what's inside. So it shows the, the ULA chip, the massive ULA chip, which does so many of the tasks, the CPU, the speaker, PAL encoder, the RAM, the ROM, so all of that in there. Uh, we've got a software catalog, which is very cool to see as well. May 1983 edition. So that tells you when my Spectrum was built. So I mentioned some of the games that are out that you can go and buy. Uh, mentions you can buy a printer for 40 quid. Again, a, a budget printer that used thermal paper, not normal paper to make it cheap. And an order form, so you could all go and order some of those games if you wanted to, like you go and order The Hobbit, for example, there, which is a bit more expensive. That was 15 quid, but some of these were just five pounds by the time um, this came out. And then we have in here the Horizons tape, which I can't get out. I'm going to have to get something to help me get that out. Um, we've got our power lead, power supply, TV lead. Um, cassette cable to connect up to a, a tape recorder. I do somewhere have an old tape recorder. Um, this got a. We have to have this because obviously so many people. I want to put this in. Who had the Spectrum? A lot of their games weren't original. It might shock you to learn. 
because they were on tape you could just copy them so everyone used to go out and buy like these 90 tapes 90 minute tapes especially tdk 90s were were very popular indeed probably the most popular one of all um and um you could get crap loads of games on a on a c90 tape the key low dip dip code i always said dip dip i know it's speech mark but i always said low dip dip i suppose the other people did as well um but yeah, that was in here when I acquired this one. This wasn't my own Spectrum that I had as a kid. I had a, when I was a kid, I had a rubber key very briefly, um, but the keyboard didn't work properly on it. And I ended up buying a membrane for it and it still had issues, um, which disappointed me. And then that Christmas I got a plus two A. So um, the following Christmas. So I didn't have a 48K for long before I got a plus two A. And there's the uh, a classic old Horizons tape with Breakthrough, you know, Breakout Clone game on it and, and other stuff um, in immaculate condition, as you can see. So that's all in there. So there's not a lot else to, to show you from that. I'll put all these bits back. But uh, as you can see, it's in, in amazing condition. I'm just going to put the box to one side, actually, and get it out of the way. And there's nothing else to show you the actual spectrum box it's not very exciting there's no pictures of games or anything on it like that um it's just a small box Yeah, let's go back to the, the old Spectrum itself. So I say part of it's the key to this was a small design. I mean, I've got fairly small hands, um, especially for a man. And I'm, and I am quite tall, so it's strange I've got such small hands. But there we go. Um, but if I put my hand next to the computer, you can see just how small it is. It's not that much bigger than my hand. So typing on one of these, um, quite awkward because it was easy to press the wrong keys. Um, but especially the fact that the keyboard is horrible to type on because it's basically you know, the keys are rubber, there's no click, um, so you don't always know you've pressed them, um, which is very, very awkward. And the entry system for BASIC, um, I hated on the 48K. I know a lot of people like it, but I hated it. And I'm so glad that with the 128K, they changed that. And I'll just mention that because I think it's important. So you'll see that on the keys, you know, obviously it's mainly for those uninformed that don't know that much about the Spectrum, but is all the basic commands. You can see you've got one on the key, then a red one above that, and then uh, a green one above that, and a red one underneath. And you'll notice you've got a symbol shift. You see that's coloured red. So that shows that there are some of these you symbol shift. So that's, that's the one on the key. The one that's red on the key is you press symbol shift to go into that. Okay, and then you've got above key nine, you'll see it says graphics. That's because you can turn on a graphics mode, which then allows you to get these graphic symbols that are on the keys. There's also extend mode, which I can't remember how you bring in extend mode now. Is it symbol shift and another button? I can't remember what it is now. I'm going to have to look at the manual. But extend mode would get you the next one, and then you could have a symbol shift extend mode to get the next one. So basically, by different key combinations, you could get more and more and more commands. But obviously, doing all of that was was very very awkward, um, and I've completely forgotten about how a lot of that was accessed. But it's all in this manual. So I was showed this already, but I wanted to bring this back because obviously it's important to what I was saying about the key commands. So basically. When you pressed, for example, to load a game, the old load dip dip, the load two speech marks, you had to do, when you were in basic, if you pressed J to bring up load, that would just, that key command would automatically bring up the word load. So you press that straight away, it would, it would come up load. And then symbol shift, P, 
P, because you probably can't see very well, but the speech mark is on the P in red. So symbol shift P, P. So that, and then symbol shift P, P. And that would load your game. Uh, and then enter to go into the load mode. And all of this keyword entry system is explained in here. So you can see here, it's split into chapters. So um, chapter one, introduction, so how it all works, basic programming concepts, and then it goes into more detailed things on how to how to access the different things. But I mean, this manual was so important for being able to get into the, the different things. It explains that basically, when the basic prompts comes up, I'll put something in the in the top corner as you can see. It has a K, a flashing K, which means you're in keyword mode. So it means it's going to, whenever you press one of those keys, like I say, it's going to bring up that keyword. So it'll bring up the whole word load or input or whatever. L for letters mode. So that's like if you're typing actual letters. Uh, and both K and symbol shift and the keys will be interpreted as subsidiary red characters, so as like I was explaining. And then you've got cap shift as well. Sorry, I meant to mention cap shift for some reason, did I? I mentioned symbol shift. Uh, and, and cap shift, you've got both. Obviously, cap shift um, makes you think like caps lock, but actually the keywords all print in capitals. When you're using letter mode, cap shift obviously does um, bring up capitals. Um, and then I think cap shift and symbol shift is it to put in extend mode? Does it mention extend mode on that bit? We've got graphics there. Oh. E for extended mode is used for obtaining further characters, mostly tokens. It occurs after both shift keys are pressed together. So I was, I was correct. Yeah, one one key depression only. So then you have to turn it back on again if you want to use it again. So yeah, I was right. It is those two keys together. So yeah, um, a very very overcomplicated way. I always thought of of entering your your basic into the into the system. You can't just type let. You have to know which key um, it is, and that's why they printed it all on the keys like that. So it's easy for you to know where each command was and you didn't have to keep referring to the manual. So clever in a way, but I just certainly didn't like that way of using BASIC. Especially since at school I was using BBC BASIC where you just typed in the commands. In fact, BBC BASIC was so good that you could shorten things. Like instead of even typing print, you could just put P dot and then it would change it to print. It was great. BBC BASIC was so much better than Spectrum BASIC. Spectrum BASIC was pretty good. Um, because it had things like user-defined graphics, you can see here. So you could change the character sets um, to make your own graphics, which is very, very good. And it was a very, very easy system. Um, but, uh, yeah, BBC Basic was certainly a lot better. I liked the in-key system in Spectrum Basic because well. it was very easy to um, uh, pick up the keyboard commands and uh, joysticks and stuff like that. Very, very easy, a lot easier than other, some other systems, but example programs at the back and stuff there. But that whole basic system was, was very important because the Spectrum booted straight into basic um, as soon as you loaded it up, no fancy menus or anything like that. So uh, that changed. It didn't have the menu system until they brought in the 128K models later on, which allowed you to go through different things. But I've looked at those those things in the other videos I've done on the, uh, the Plus 2 and the Plus 3. We'll go around the computer itself, apart from the keyboard, to see what else you've got. So obviously this is a metal plate on the front underneath the keyboard. Um, these are quite often rubbed and damaged, so it's amazing to see one that's in um, in this kind of condition, apart from, say, the, the paint that's rubbed off the ZX at the top there, unfortunately. That would be easy to put back on if I wanted to do that, though. Um, nothing along the front, because it was a budget model. It had nothing like joystick ports. I'll go into that in a moment. Um, nothing on each either side of it on the back you have your speaker horrible internal speaker the sound didn't come through the TV until later models see there it says again that it's a 48k model just so we know it's got some little rubber feet still on the sit on the desk well plastic feet really not even rubber and on the back we have our interface um, port 
So you'd put your joystick interface into that um, if you want to use joysticks. But everything else had to use that port as well. So you're obviously you're using that for printers and modems and things like that as well. Your standard 9 volt DC, your mic in here for connecting up your cassette deck and your TV RF. No monitor outputs, um, no nothing like that. Really bare bones. Your expansion port interface, whatever you want to call it. Your, your mic in here, TV and, and 9 volt DC, that's it. Later models did, like the 120K models, have RGB out, for example. Um, so there was monitor connections available. Uh, and the picture wasn't always great, but I mean, when I had a Spectrum back then, my rubber key, I had to use it with black and white TV, had no choice, so it was, that was fine. There were the old manual tuning knob on it. Um, it was much later that I got a colour TV. In fact, I think by the time I got a colour TV... I probably was about the time I got an Atari ST. In fact, I had a, uh, I used a black and white TV for most, of, black and white TV for most of the time. I had a Spectrum, um, although on Sundays, only Sundays, we were allowed to take the Spectrum downstairs and use the colour TV. So I would make a point of playing games that had lots of colour, like for example, uh, Dan Dare Three or something like that. One of the, the uh, the the uh, probe games had you know, colour all over the place. Savage is another one. I liked playing because it, they actually used the colour really, really well. Um, whereas not always ga not all games did. Uh, for example, something monochrome like Robocop, it was monochrome anyway, didn't look that worse on a black and white TV, you know. Um, but that's it. That's you know, there's there's you know, usually when you go around the computer and look at it all, there's loads to look at. But with the Spectrum, there really isn't because it, it's a budget computer built to have as you know minimalistic um, design. Uh, and that's it. I mean, there is some games, like I say, I've put in the background here, so I put some different stuff. So I've got a games designer there. Many different types of games. I mean, this is big plastic cases you have for the Spectrum, like this. Um, so there we go, games designer. It's quite limited, that games designer, from what I remember. Berserk game format. They couldn't even spell Berserk, which is funny. Invaders Galaxians game format, Defender Scramble game format, Asteroids game format. So it's quite limited in what you could do with it. It's a budget games, as I said, like BMX Freestyle. This one's not even just a budget game. It's a budget game, and it's a budget compilation. So it's got four games on it. Invaders, Buncher, Axions. Um, which is three games for the price of one, but it's triple four-decker, so that's rubbish, then, isn't it? So it's, it's not four games. It's not a triple four-decker, is it? It's only got three games on it. I think there were ones with four on. You can see there, Axions... Galaxians, Invaders, Space Invaders, Muncher, Pac-Man, of course. So they're just old arcade rip-offs. But three on one tape, pretty good value, isn't it? Three for the price of one. Um, I wanted to put a, a proper compilation on here because these always came in these nice big cardboard boxes. This is a particularly good one, Bow Jolly Value Pack. Bow Jolly actually bought up the software catalogs for loads of companies from the early 80s and then re-released their games. And one of the companies they bought, the first ones they bought actually, was Imagine Play the Game. So this is a compilation of Imagine's games. So as you can see, you've got Cosmic Cruiser, being Beastie Bill, Pedro Zazoon, or Zoom, uh, Zip Zap, and Alchemist. So good, good compilation of games there. They were great value for money. I had loads of the Bow Jolly compilations um, inside. What have we got inside? There's a instruction manual, and we've got three tapes. They're always good. And then I've got an original Sinclair release here. So we've got Flip It. And first, some of the Sinclair releases came in these nice cardboard boxes. And then later, they just put the games in tape boxes, single tape boxes. Um, you did get some games in double tape boxes and stuff as well. But I um, thought it might be nice to see an original uh, Sinclair release. So there we go. It's just a few odd games. But I don't think I need to really show you much about the games themselves. I just thought it would be interesting to stick some stick some in this video as, as background and and stuff um but yeah there's probably not really much else to tell you it's the spectrum i think we all know about the spectrum if we're in the uk if we're in america maybe not so much because it's a bit of a, a strange thing to you american guys because you can't understand why we liked this computer that had an awful keyboard and had ugly graphics that color clashed all over the place and had terrible sound when until the 128k came along which didn't have terrible sound um but the Color Clash, I think, is one of the most um, iconic features of the Spectrum, and that's because of its design. They were trying to do everything cheap. So it can only have two colours in one um, 
uh, character block of the screen. Remember, actually, in the, the basic um, manual, uh, just to go back a moment, where I showed you how it did use defined graphics, there's a bit there about the, uh, a letter there. So you can see you've got an 8x8 eight eight square. So everything on the spectrum is these 8x8 eight eight squares. So within these 8x8 eight eight character blocks, you can only have two colours. So that made doing games quite difficult because if one image, especially scrolling images, moved into the next character block, um, it would cause the colours to clash. So it could only still show two colours. So then the graphics would look a bit messy because on certain parts of the screen, the colours would be wrong and other parts they'd be right. Clever programmers did find ways around it. Like one common technique was to shift the screen in whole character blocks. Um, but you had to do that quickly so it didn't look jerky. So you had to make the game very fast, which of course was, could be difficult in itself on the spectrum. Um, or they do things like put very big black borders around characters. Um, so the black wouldn't clash because you're always using the common black borders around everything. Um, there was various ways of doing it, you know, not using intricate backgrounds because that was all a no-no on the spectrum. Um, but yeah, it was certainly... Um, amazing how many different ways they came up with to try and combat color clash or well, some people just would, wouldn't try at all um and they would sacrifice the color for detail or do their games in monochrome so you can have loads of detail because you had a pretty decent resolution i think it's 256192 so pretty decent for the time on the spectrum um so that was what a lot of people would do but it was an iconic part of the spectrum and its design was the whole color clash thing um and they never removed it not even the later 128k spectrums they still had it um, they didn't remove that those those colour and graphics limitations at all. You know, if you grew up in the UK back in the 80s, the Spectrum was, was, everyone had them. I mean, growing up in my school, there was, I only knew one person who had a Commodore 64. I only knew one person who had an Amstrad. I only knew one person who had a BBC. I knew someone who had a C16. I knew someone who had a VIC-20. Um, that was it, really. Uh, I didn't know anyone else with anything else um, particularly fancy. Uh and everyone had spectrums it was a phenomenon because you could copy your games off your mates the games were cheap the computers were cheap um and it's easy to see why it was a success in it that success was down to the price okay you could buy stuff you know much better computers around that time like you know the atari 8-bit for example um but they were unaffordable and to british people the price thing was a big a big big thing and we bought these you know in their droves and there's other countries where the spectrum did well i know people talk about it as a, a very much a uk thing because sinclair are a uk company and it was designed with the uk in mind but you know the spectrum did very very well in portugal for example uh very well they have big big following in portugal um it did very well in eastern europe especially russia but not officially they they they, they cloned the spectrum made all their own versions so there's tons of of different versions of the spectrum um, from Eastern Europe and Russia in particular. It did quite well in Spain as well, the Spectrum. It's quite popular there. In fact, the 128K Spectrum was launched in Spain first, of course, um, before it came to the UK after. So it shows that it was quite popular there. Um, they were the main three countries, I think, for the Spectrum. Uh, the, the, the proper Spectrum, I suppose, would be Portugal, Spain and, and the UK, and then obviously the Russian thing. We didn't know about too much later on once the, um, the uh, Iron Curtain came down. But, you know... If you're a, a British home computing fan or you're a British retro collector, um, then you probably should have a Spectrum somewhere in your collection. It's kind of one of those computers that you sort of kind of need to have. It's uh, essential. Although personally, I, I would get a one to eight K and not a rubber key because I'd want the the better sound and I'd want the uh, sound coming through the TV and um, things like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to the Americans, it's probably still confusing. You guys got your own version of the Spectrum, which wasn't fully compatible 
which was a, a really bad idea. The Timex Sinclair 2048 and 2068, which did very badly in America, unfortunately. And um, that's because it looked looked probably not great next to stuff like the Atari 8-bit and Commodore 64 um, with its color clash and graphics and, uh, and had a limited software range in the US because it couldn't use existing Spectrum games because they changed the ROM um, in the computer and changed the layout. Like, for example, they put a proper sound chip in it before the Spectrum had a proper sound chip. So they should have made it backwards compatible in its design and who knows, it might have done different in America. But... Um, but yeah, I mean, some Americans do like to try and import these and get them working on their TVs to see what it's all about. But um, I think it's a very British thing. And I think, you know, a lot of Americans I've spoken to, even after importing them, they're a bit like, because still can't understand what the Spectrum's all about. You really did have to be there at the time. You know, it's it's a British icon, the Spectrum. Um, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed my look back at the um, the good old rubber key Spectrum. Um, there's some Spectrum coverage for you. Um, and... Uh, I thank you for watching as always. Please share your Spectrum memories down in the comments. And I'll see you all again for another video very soon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.